On tonight's summary of the Israel-Hamas War, Day 178, the Israeli delegation to the hostage negotiation extends its stay in Cairo, reporting initial positivity but cautioning against optimism. The IDF concludes its operation in Al-Shifa Hospital and evacuates the area. Pictures of utter devastation begin to emerge. Aid workers of the World Central Kitchen reportedly killed in a bombing in central Gaza. The IDF states it is investigating the matter. Muhammad Raza Zahedi, the commander of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards in charge of the entire group's operation in Syria and in Lebanon, was assassinated today along with his deputy. Iran promises extreme retaliations. Israel passes a law that will allow the government to shut down Al Jazeera in the country. Netanyahu pledged to shut down the network after the move was halted in November out of fear that it would disrupt hostage negotiations. Hello everyone. I am Alon Burstein, visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute Fellow at the University of California, Irvine. Here I bring you the summary of the last 24 hours of the Israel-Hamas War. It is currently the evening of April 1st, 2024 in the United States, the morning of April 2nd, 2024 in the Middle East. Starting with the Hadza situation, contrary to the initial pessimism, it was reported today that the Israeli delegation is extending its stay in Cairo for the hostage negotiations, and that there may be the first potential signs of advances in the talks. The sources reporting this emphasized, however, that it is too early for optimism, and stated that negotiations are currently only being held between the Israel and the negotiating countries, i.e. Israel and Egypt and Qatar, not with Hamas itself. The negotiators are now going to take the current position to Hamas. Based on the group's answer, it will be decided if the negotiations should continue in Cairo, and if should they, be, they should be moved to a higher level, i.e. if they should involve the head of the Mossad, Dedi Barnea, possibly the head of the CIA, William Barnes, remains to be seen how it develops. Right now, the sides are going to take this to Hamas and then await their response. Moving on to the situation in the Gaza Strip, there were no rockets or mortars that were fired from the Gaza Strip towards Israel in the last 24 hours. Regarding the fighting in the Gaza Strip, the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, after I reported yesterday that eyewitnesses on the ground had stated that they had noticed IDF tanks were evacuating the areas around Al Shifa Hospital, the IDF announced today that it has concluded its operation in the region and is evacuating the compound. According to the IDF, 913 Palestinians were arrested during this two-week operation, and over 200 terror operatives were killed during the fighting. IDF spokesperson Daniel Hagari also added that a substantial amount of valuable intelligence has been learned during the operation, stating that this resulted both from the interrogation of different people who were arrested, as well as from documents and videos and security camera footage that was found in the hospital. He also stated that Hamas had turned the hospital into a military headquarters, and in doing so, Hamas destroyed the medical, the medical facility. Relating to this, these are some of the pictures that are emerging from Al Shifa Hospital as the IDF has evacuated the area and also evacuated the different rings that were surrounding the hospital and Palestinians are starting to come closer to the compound again. They show the destroyed buildings and that the compound itself has been severely damaged and non-functional. It was reported later in the day that the IDF estimates that Al-Shifa will not be used as a terror headquarters again. After the IDF completed its evacuation, medical sources in the Gaza Strip stated that some 300 bodies have been found among the wreckage of the different buildings of Al-Shifa Hospital. I will state, however, this was not stated by the Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip. It was stated by paramedics on the ground, so it remains to be seen what the final tally actually is. In addition to this, in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, there was ongoing fighting that was reported in the Rimal areas of Gaza City. As well as bombings that were reported in the, in the Jabali refugee camp, it was not reported specifically what was targeted, just so that there was extensive bombing. In the central parts of the Gaza Strip, in a Musirat refugee camp, a car was targeted with missiles and two people were killed. Several people were also reported injured. It was not reported if they were also in the car or bystanders. Sources on the ground stated that the car belongs to the Interior Ministry of Hamas. It was not reported, however, who the people who were killed were. The IDF did not put out a statement also who the target of this seeming assassination was. In addition to this, there was more fighting than was reported in the central parts of the Gaza Strip. As is, is common, it was not reported specifically where. Likely, this is in the outskirts of Al-Nusrat refugee camp, al Baraj refugee camp, and then the Tsarim corridor. That is where most of the fighting is, is occurring right now, central parts of the Gaza Strip. But again, that is estimating all that was reported is that there were intensive gun battles.
In the southern parts of the Gaza Strip, in Han Yunis, is ongoing fighting that was reported in the El Amal region, this is in the western parts of Han Yunis, as well as in the Al Qarara region, in the eastern parts of Han Yunis. Several days ago, I stated that there was a th- substantial bombing that occurred in the northern parts of Han Yunis, and that this may indicate that the IDF is planning to move into that region. However, since then, it has been two days, there's been no reports of the IDF actually moving into the region, so it appears that was more of a one-off bombing, rather than the IDF actually planning an operation. However, as always, remains to be seen in the coming days. Meanwhile, in Rafah, there were reports of several rounds of IDF bombings, one of the more substantial ones in the areas of El Barazil, this is in the heart of Rafah. Two people were reportedly killed in this bombing. Other news related to the Gaza Strip, and specifically to the possible invasion of Rafah. After the back and forth with regards to the expected meeting between Israeli and U.S. officials with regards to this invasion, and specifically after Prime Minister Netanyahu canceled the delegation that was supposed to meet with with U.S. officials last week, today the meeting did occur, and it occurred virtually. Among others, the Israeli side was headed by the Israeli head of National Security Council, Tzachy Negbi, and Minister Ron Dermer, who is part of Israel's war cabinet. On the United States, the meeting was chaired by the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan. It was not reported what was specifically discussed in the meeting that took over two hours. The Israeli delegation in advance stated that it was going to present the United States with the plans for the Rafah invasion and the evacuation of Palestinian civilians, while the United States repeatedly stated that they are going to present Israel with different alternatives to a Rafah invasion. At the end of the meeting, a joint statement was issued stating that Israel will take into consideration the United States' concerns with regards to military operation in Rafah. It was also decided that this would be the first round of talks and the Israeli delegation is going to travel physically to the United States to continue the talks in the next phase of these discussions. Regarding casualties, no IDF soldiers reported killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. This leaves the total number of IDF soldiers killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began on 256. Four IDF soldiers reported injured in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. This brings the total number of IDF soldiers injured in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began on 1,549. The Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip has reported that they reporting that 63 Palestinians were killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. This brings the total number of Palestinians that were killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began to 32,845. 75,392 Palestinians reported injured in the Gaza Strip since the war began. And I remind everyone that there are still estimated between 7,000 and 10,000 Palestinians that are buried under the different rubbles of the buildings in the Gaza Strip and are presumed dead. Moving on to the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip, the missions para-dropping aid into the Gaza Strip, and specifically the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, continued in the last 24 hours. Among others, it was reported that eight different planes from six different countries participated in the para-dropping of aid today. These include the countries of Jordan, the United States, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, Germany, and the United Kingdom. It was not reported specifically how much aid was dropped and where was it dropped in the different regions of the Gaza Strip. Previously, the IDF reported that each one of these aid packages weighs at least one ton and is commonly carrying uh, mostly foodstuffs as well as other humanitarian supplies. In addition to this, Cyprus reported today that the three ships that departed Cyprus a few days ago on their way to Gaza are approaching the Gaza shores and that they have been granted permission to dock and unload humanitarian aid. Reportedly, this includes 400 tons of food. Other news, reports came in today that an IDF bombing that occurred in the areas of Deir al-Balah, this is in the central parts of the Gaza Strip, four foreign citizens who are workers of the International World Central Kitchen Organization were killed along with their Palestinian driver. Responding to the reports, the IDF put out a statement saying, quote, We are conducting the highest level of investigations in order to understand the circumstances of this tragic incident. The IDF invests great effort to ensure the delivery of humanitarian aid safely and has worked closely with the World Central Kitchen in order to supply food and humanitarian aid to Gaza civilians. The World Central Kitchen also responded to the report, stating, This is a tragedy. Humanitarian aid workers and civilians should never, be t- should never be targets in war. I will say that the IDF is likely to conduct a very thorough investigation, since the IDF has a vested interest in working with the World Central Kitchen, because the IDF has been trying to phase UNRWA, which is the by far the most established aid organization in the Gaza Strip, out of humanitarian aid operations. The IDF has announced that it is going to stop working with UNRWA and has been trying to work with other organizations like the the World Food Program and the World Central Kitchen, remains to be seen how this attack will affect the relationship between the IDF and the World Central Kitchen, and how it will affect the IDF's attempts to phase UNRWA out of the picture.
In addition to this, there was one report that stated today that an IDF soldier opened fire in the direction of a truck of the World Central Kitchen. I say, however, that this was one report that was unsubstantiated by any of the other news agencies, so if I find out more about this, I'll report more about it in the coming days. Moving on to the West Bank. In a statement that was given today, Israel's finance minister and head of the religious Zionism party, Betsal Smotrich, said that the civil administration, that is the arm of the IDF that is in charge of civil matters in the West Bank, has declared another 170 dunams, that is 42 acres, near the Gush Etzion settlement block as state lands. Declaring something as state lands is the first step towards the establishment or expansion of settlements in a way that they will be legal by the Israeli law compared to unauthorized settlements that are uh, that are developed not on state lands. Smotrich stated in his announcement, This is wonderful news for the settlement project, for Gush Etzion, and for historic justice, adding congratulations to Gush Etzion, to the settlement project, and to the state of Israel. I will say this was unlikely to have any immediate effects, the development of a settlement in the West Bank requires years of permits that are processed through the Ministry of Defense and eventually through the Prime Minister's office. However, the mere fact that more state lands are are defined within the West Bank both is a signal that there is intent to develop settlements later on, and this does end up having some impact. However, it will take years until the settlements are actually developed. In addition to this, in another speech that was given today, Smotrich stated that due to his insistence, alongside the work of Prime Minister Netanyahu and Minister Ron Dermer, the United States has sent a letter substantially reducing the scale of sanctions that they imposed on violent settlers in the West Bank, allowing the unfreezing of the bank accounts that were frozen as a result of these sanctions. The report, however, in Israel's Ynet news station, stated that the news agency checked with the banks, and, I quote what it said in the news agency, it appears that the banks have not yet received these new instructions from the U.S. administration that Smotrich is saying are a result of his efforts. In addition to this, in the West Bank, there was substantial IDF activity that was reported in various different areas. Among others, these were in the Dora village, where the attacker from Ganyavne came from yesterday, as well as in the areas of Sabah Lahir village and other areas. Nine Palestinians were reported arrested in the last 24 hours by the IDF. The Palestinian Prisoner Society did not put out its own numbers of how many Palestinians were arrested. Moving on to the northern parts of Israel and to Lebanon and the Syrian fronts, there were barrages of rockets and missiles that were fired from Lebanon targeting the northern parts of Israel in the last 24 hours. Several barrages targeted both the Upper Galilee and the Western Galilee areas of Israel. These include the areas of Rosh Nikra, Batsat, Achziv. There were also rockets that were fired towards the areas of Hardov, Minara, and Beit Hillel. There were also drone alerts that were sounded in the Upper Galilee and they were possibly intercepted by the IDF. I say possibly because there were drone alerts that were sounded then civilians in northern parts of Israel reported hearing large explosions. Then the IDF announced that, in fact, the event was over. So the IDF did not announce that they were intercepted. However, that is very likely. Regarding IDF activity in Lebanon, IDF warplanes targeted Hezbollah military structures in the areas of Hanin, as well as weapons warehouses in the areas of Jabal Hamamis and Ita Shaab. In a separate round of attacks, the IDF reported attacking 10 different Hezbollah targets simultaneously, all on the Lebanese side of Hardov. Reportedly, among these th- those th- attacks of the ten simultaneous targets were weapons warehouses, launching sites, and other Hezbollah infrastructure. In addition to this, Al Manar reported artillery fire of the IDF in the areas of Anakora, and Al Jazeera also reported three IDF attacks in the areas of Rashia El Fahar. In addition to all this, in Syria, the most significant assassination in the ongoing escalation between Israel and Iran and the different Iranian proxies occurred in Syria today. While Israel did not officially claim responsibility, the New York Times did quote four Israeli officials stating that the IDF is behind the the attack. According to different reports, six missiles were fired from an F-35 targeting a building that's adjacent to the Iranian consulate, and some reports state that it is actually within the compounds of the diplomatic mission in Damascus, and adjacent to the Canadian embassy as well. A series of people were killed in this attack that were, that were very significant in the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. The most significant among them is Muhammad Raza Zahedi. He is a commander of all Iranian Revolutionary Guard forces in Syria and Lebanon, essentially making him the most senior Iranian figure in the region. He was previously the commander of the Air Force and ground units of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards many years ago during the Iran-Iraq War, and in his current role he was in charge of all ground operations, air operations, and coordination of the different militias in the region of Syria and Lebanon, that is, all the militias that are working with Iran.
He personally oversaw the coordination of weapons transfers to Hezbollah and all the violent activity the different militias carried out both against the United States and against Israel. The Syrian research center Nours is quoted as stating that, he, that this is the most significant assassination since the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, the leader of the Quds Force of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, four years ago. In addition to this, alongside him, his deputy, General Muhammad Hadi Haji Rahimi, was also killed, and Brigadier General Hussein Amirullah, the chief of general staff for the Quds Force in Syria and Lebanon, was also among the victims. In addition to this, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard stated that four more officers were killed in the attack, however, beyond their names, it was not reported what their specific role was. The New York Times also quoted Iranian Revolutionary Guard members as stating that the missiles targeted a meeting between the Palestinian Islamic Jihad leaders and the top Iranian Revolutionary Guard leaders in the region. However, thus far, there have been no reports about Palestinian Islamic Jihad leaders among the casualties. I will say that the leader of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Ziad, Ziad Nahalla, ha was in Iran several days ago, so it is possible that either he sent emissaries or possibly he was even supposed to be in this meeting. We will learn more about this in the coming days. Iran pledged major retaliation, stating that the level of retaliation will match the level of the assassinations. The first, I will say very, very low-level retaliation thus far occurred seemingly hours later. Drone alerts were sounded all over Israel's Golan Heights, and the IDF later reported that a cruise missile was making its way towards Israeli airspace and was intercepted over Syria. Pro-Iranian militias claimed responsibility, stating that this is a retaliation for the assassination. Several hours later, IDF airstrikes were also reported in the Ma'ariya region of Syria, targeting pro-Iranian militias who seemingly tar launched those missiles. I will say, however, yet again, that this is likely a very, very initial response. We are likely to see either different Iranian proxies or Iran itself responding to this attack. In the, in the coming days, I will say again, this is the most high-profile assassination that has been carried out, certainly between Israel and Iran, in the last several years, and um, it is among the higher-profile assassinations that have been carried out since the war began, possibly among others with Salah al who is number two or three in the Hamas leadership that was carried out in Lebanon. Moving on to some of the political and general trends from the last 24 hours, this attack that I just stated in Syria was condemned by a range of actors and different countries. These include condemnations by Hamas, Russia, Qatar, and obviously Iran and Syria. Most stated that this constitutes a gross violation of international law since a diplomatic mission was attacked in the, in the compound of the Iranian consulate in Syria. Most of them also demanded that, that the international community combine to heavily condemn Israel and demanded action from the UN Security Council. Other political news. Politico reported today that the Biden administration informed the relative Congress committees of the intent to sell up to 50 new F-15 warplanes to Israel, as well as advanced air-to-air -air missiles of a medium range, as well as kits to transfor transform unguided bombs into quote-unquote smart bombs. The actual sale of planes and their transfer to Israel is likely to take several years. The impact of that this will have on the war is more in the declarative level that the, despite the ongoing tensions between the Israeli government and the Biden administration, the Biden administration is still going ahead with the sale of arms to Israel, and alongside the, alongside the different statements about these sales, it was also stated that the Biden administration continuously supports Israel's right to defend itself. Other political news, the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke today with the Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas. According to what was published, Blinken emphasized that the United States is still trying to push for a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip, and stated that he looks forward to working with a new Palestinian government, and that there is still need for a lot more reforms, and that the world needs a rejuvenated Palestinian Authority. Other political news, in Israel, the law allowing the Minister of Communications to ban foreign news agencies if they pose a danger to the country's security was officially passed in the Israeli Knesset today. The law, which has been dubbed the Al Jazeera law, authorizes the Minister of Communications to cooperate with the Prime Minister and issue immediate closure of news agencies in the country if security report states that they are harming or endangering the country's security. The law permits the closing of the agency, confiscating its equipment, removing it from cable and satellite, and blocking its internet access, among other things. After the law was passed, the Minister of Communications, Shlomo Kari, immediately stated, There will not be freedom of expression for the champions of Hamas and Israel. Al Jazeera will be closed in the coming days. Prime Minister Netanyahu also tweeted that Al Jazeera is a terror channel, stating that it has harmed Israel's security and was an active participant in the October 7th attack. 
Despite this, I will say that immediately after October 7th, emergency regulations were implemented in Israel, and the channel could have been closed immediately by the Prime Minister or the Minister of Defense. However, senior political sources stated then that this may disrupt the hostage negotiations process since they are being mediated by Qatar, and Qatar obviously has a vested interest in Al Jazeera, a Qatari channel, continuing to operate. Likud sources stated that yesterday Netanyahu instructed the Likud to pass the law immediately and this was done today. Different sources in Israel speculated regarding why Netanyahu was so pressured to do this. So the sources stated two opposing reasons. One said that this is another mechanism of applying pressure on Qatar to throw its weight into the hostage negotiations and put pressure on Hamas. While the, whereas other sources stated that Prime Minister Netanyahu is doing this now in order to try to torpedo the deal to get Qatar to slam the door on any possible developments in a hostage in hostage negotiations. The White House also responded, stating that this is a concerning move and that the United States supports the work of journalists all over the world, including Gaza. It is especially interesting to see how this is going to affect Al Jazeera operating in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Technically, the offices of Al Jazeera can be closed in Israel, and the channel can also be blocked in Israel, but can also still operate in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. However, Israel does have the technological capability of blocking the channel there also. Remains to be seen how this, ha how this happens, if it happens, and what effect it will also have on the protection that reporters of Al Jazeera are granted in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank. If you find these reports important, please do remember to hit that like button, subscribe, turn on notifications if you want to know when reports come out. If you have any questions or comments or requests for videos that will focus on more specific issues, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. That is my report for the last 24 hours. I'll be back tomorrow.